open our Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2 as we begin a brand new study here. We'll be looking at the next three weeks talking about the walking dead. A couple of years ago, the topic of zombies became so popular in our society. I mean, everywhere you turned was movies and TV shows and books and everything else. And you had video games that had nothing to do with zombies. We're coming out with zombie mode because it was so popular and so much money was coming in. And there's a lot of different ideas about where zombies originated, um, where the topic or the idea of them even came up. One such idea is found in Matthew chapter number 27, verses 52 and 53, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ gave up the ghost. It says in verse 52, And the graves were opened, Many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after His resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. And you talk about the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to give life. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But He was not the only one that rose from the dead that day. He was the only one who rose Himself from the dead. But because the circumstances and the events of life were so powerful in the Lord Jesus Christ, it tells us many of the saints, now we don't know how many, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them, rose from the dead. We have no idea how long they'd been dead, how long they'd been in the grave. But they rose from the dead and went back to the point where people understood who they were, they understood they had been dead, and they're seeing these people who were alive. And so you have quite a fascinating circumstance that happens at the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's some people that talk about the idea of maybe zombies came from this portion of Scripture, the idea and the mythology of them all. There's a bunch of them. But, you know, as we stop and, and consider, I want you to consider this, is we have a lot of people who have found life in the Lord Jesus Christ, but they live as if they are still dead. They live in sin like they are still dead. They are walking spiritual zombies. And Ephesians chapter number 2, the Bible tells us this. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. says, and you hath he quickened. That word quickened means made alive. Who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. You notice a couple of words there. I want you to pay attention to what it says about those who have not put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. In verse number 1 it says, And you hath he quickened who were what, church? Dead. Who were dead. They were dead. In verse number 5 he says, Even when we were what? Dead, dead in sins. He hath quickened us. Before we come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, we're not just spiritually sick. It's not that just we have a little problem that we need a little ointment, we need a little band-aid, something put on it. No, he says without Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are dead in your sins. And somebody who's dead in their sins has no power to help themselves 
at all. Yeah. And you and I have no power to save ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, sir. Going to church is not going to help you. You know why? Because you are dead and you cannot help yourself. Doing good works is not going to help you as far as salvation is concerned because you're dead and you can't help yourself. Being baptized when you're dead doesn't mean a thing. It's just a cold, dead, wet body. That's it. It's only the Lord Jesus Christ who can help us. In Colossians chapter number 2, turn over there, Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2, we'll begin reading in verse number 13, says, And you being what? Dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So he says, We were dead in our sins. But it's Christ that has given us life. In John chapter 10 and verse number 10, the Bible says, And Jesus himself said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Remember what he said in John chapter 14 and verse number 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He said in John chapter 20 and verse number 31, But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that believing ye might have life through His name. If you're here today without Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want you to understand that right at this moment you are dead in your trespasses and sins. And if you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will suffer an eternal death forever in the lake of fire. That's what all of us deserve because of our sin. That's not what God wants for you. He's offering you everlasting life, and He is the only source of life. We put our faith and trust in Him. He says, there will be a well of water within you springing up unto everlasting life. Think of what He says in the book of Revelation. Whoever is thirsty, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. See, we're dead in our trespasses and sins but the Lord Jesus Christ gives us life. We are born again, brand new. But unfortunately, there are many of us that want to live like we're still dead. We want to take the stinking death of sin and carry it around with us everywhere we go. We walk around like spiritual zombies so that when people look at us, they don't see somebody with joy and with life and with vigor. They see the dead walking around. They smell the, the stench of death and of sin all over us. Because we want to live like we're still dead. When we get to our portion of Scripture, our text for this series in Colossians chapter number 3, now that we've kind of laid the groundwork about where we're going in this series, let's look at what he says to the Colossians. He says, if you then be risen with Christ, we talked about that word if is the idea of since. Since you have been risen with Christ, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are no longer dead in your trespasses and sins. You have been given life. And he expects us to live a certain way now. He says, if you've been given life, you've trusted Jesus, you are to seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. You are to set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, your old man is dead. Your life is hid with Christ in God. It says, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. And man, we look forward to that day because there's going to be a change in us on that day. And all the sin and that struggle that we have with the old man and the old nature is going to be done away with. We're going to be transformed because we're going to see him as he is, the Bible tells us, and we're going to be like him. 
But he says in verse 5, so we talked about we're to seek those things which are above, we're to set our affection on things above. Here's another command that he gives us. He says, mortify. Now I've underlined that word mortify in my Bible. It's the idea of put to death. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And he's going to tell us what those members are that we are to put to death in our lives. Fornication. Uncleanness. Inordinate affection. Evil concupiscence and covetousness which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience in the which he also walked sometime when he lived in them. And one of the things that you'll notice in these scriptures that we've looked at, he said, listen, this is the way you used to be before you came to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're to be different now. We're to leave the sin and the filth and the wickedness and the selfishness and all that stuff behind. And now we're to walk in newness of life, as Romans chapter number 6 tells us. But as he's talking to the Christians, he says that's to be past tense. Unfortunately, a lot of us, we keep it in the present tense. Yeah. But here we're going to look at these five things over the next couple of weeks. We're going to break it down into three categories here. He says we're to mortify these members, fornication and uncleanness. We're going to look at that today under the topic of sex. Some of you are going to be very uncomfortable today. Uh, you, sh you shouldn't be. The Apostle Paul had a lot to say on the topic. So we shouldn't be afraid to talk about it as well. The world is certainly talking about it, so we better be saying something. Uh, inordinate affection and evil concupiscence. We're going to look at those next week, Lord willing, talking about lust. And then he says covetousness, which is idolatry. So the next three weeks we're going to cover this. We really could make this series go on for a long time as you read down through the rest of the chapter. He said there's some other things you're to put off as well. But we will not take some time in this series to cover those. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, Lord, that you reached out with everlasting life to give us. We're thankful for those of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that there was a time and there was a day where we recognized our sin and the penalty that it brought and that the only answer was the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to save us from our sins and give us life. But we pray for those who may be here today, whether in the auditorium, whether our boys and girls downstairs that have never put their faith and trust in Jesus. I pray that today would be the day where they find new life, that they are raised again, just like these saints that we read about. Lord, I pray that you'd work in our hearts. Lord, today we're speaking mainly to Christians, and I pray that you'd help us to search our hearts in these areas or maybe some other area that we're not touching on. That, Lord, we are living as though we're dead, even though we've been given life. And I pray that we would put off these things, that we would put to death these sins in our lives, and we would live holy and pure before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. No, so we're going to talk this morning. He says, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication and uncleanness. Now sex in the right context is a wonderful thing. God is the one who created it. And he's the one who designed the parameters for which it is to be enjoyed. We find that very clearly in scripture that the only appropriate time that it is to be enjoyed is between a husband and a wife in holy matrimony, what we call marriage. That is the only time. Everything else outside of that is out of bounds, whether premarital or extramarital. Now, I find it very troubling when married couples go long periods of time without having sex. That, that, that shows there's a problem. Now, I understand there are health issues. I understand as we get a little bit older that uh, nature takes its course and things kind of slow down a little bit. But for the most part, looking around this room, I told you some of you are going to get uncomfortable. It ought to be a regular part of your life with your husband and your wife. It's a gift that God has given to enjoy. And when it's not present... It shows a lack of intimacy. It is a sign that there are problems 
that are underneath that need to be taken care of and need to be dealt with. In fact, one of the very first things that I do when someone says, me and my husband, me and my wife, we need to come in for some counseling, one of the very first things that I ask them about is about their life together physically. Because it shows and tells me where the problems began and how deep the problems go. But in 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, the Apostle Paul is instructing the believers. Like I said, the Apostle Paul had a lot to say about sex. I'm not ashamed or embarrassed to talk about it. The Apostle Paul did. And I am amazed at the number of Christian couples that I talk to who are struggling in this area of their married life together. 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, beginning in verse number 1, and, and I always point out as we get to this portion of Scripture, those that may not understand, the Apostle Paul here is answering a letter that the Corinthians wrote to him. So we don't know the specifics of some of the things that he's writing about, so we need to be careful about the way that we try to apply some of these things. He's answering a letter here. He says, now concerning the things whereof he wrote unto me. Okay, so they have written and asked him a specific question. We don't know the question. We don't need to know the question. But he says, concerning that specific question, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. It's not a blanket statement. Um, and he's talking to married people here. We know that because we continue to read down. But he says, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. He's, he's talking about sex there when he talks about due benevolence. He says, the wife hath not power over of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. And, and we spent some time talking about um, in our abuse series, the, con the mutual consent that ought to take place even between husbands and wives. Husband, you can rape your wife. Okay, if it is rape if she doesn't want to have sex with you and you have sex with her, okay? Some people teach that, well, if you're married, you can't, that means you can't rape your wife or, or vice versa. It, it can't happen, okay? So it ought to be mutual. Um, and so some people take this verse and, and take it uh, and, and apply it in a way the Apostle Paul did not intend to mean I can just do whatever I want. That's not what the verse is teaching. He says, defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. And really, as the Apostle Paul, well, he says in verse number 6, I speak this by permission and not of commandment. Um, and so, he says, this is not a command, but this is my suggestion to you, that you don't go long periods of time as husband and wife without having sex, because... It can cause problems. It can cause. It can lead to temptation, um, and so you want to you want to avoid that temptation if all possible. He says, "My advice is the only reason that you would not, on a regular basis, come together, is to give yourselves to fasting and prayer." He says that's the only reason, in my personal opinion. That's what the Apostle Paul says. In my personal opinion, that would be the only reason you would not, on a regular basis. Have a physical relationship with your husband and your wife. And if you do that, you are defrauding. You are cheating your husband and your wife or your wife. And so within the confines of marriage, sex is not dirty. It's not shameful. It's not sinful. It's something that is meant to be enjoyed and to be a help and a blessing to your relationship and to draw you closer to one another. But Paul told the Corinthians, that as far as sex outside of bounds, outside, whether before marriage or extramarital, you're to put that to death. Outside of marriage, it is dirty. Outside of marriage, sex should be shameful. It is filthy and sinful. Paul told the Colossians, you need to put that to death. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 3, Paul told the Ephesians, 
But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become as saints. He says as far as fornication, now fornication, that's the word porneia. It's where we get the word pornography from. It includes all forms of sexual impurity. You name the brand of sexual impurity and it's included in the word fornication. Whether it's what you look at with your eyes, what you listen to with your ears, or what you physically do with any part of your body. It's all included in the word fornication. So any sort of sexual impurity, anything that is outside the bounds of husband and wife, he said it should never once be named among you. It should not ever be part of a Christian's life. A Christian has no means ever looking at pornography, ever. No matter what the excuse is. There's no excuse for it. It should not be once named among a Christian. A Christian should never have sex before they get married, ever. There is no excuse for it. And if you don't want to go down a road, you never start down a road. That means probably not holding hands before you get married. That means not kissing before you get married. That means not being too close. You want to put up all the safeguards you can. I would not be alone in a room with somebody who's of the opposite sex. Why? Because I don't want to go down the road. I don't ever want to get to a place. He said it should not once be named among you. It should never happen. Ever. (coughs) Uncleanness is the idea of the impurity or the filthiness of lustful and luxurious living. He said these things should never be part of a Christian's life. It is not once to be named among you. And yet as Christians in our society today, and really they had a problem in their society as well, is that sex was everywhere. Immorality was everywhere you turned. It was just a normal part of everyday life. And so part of the problem with that is we can kind of be grown conditioned to it. To think it's not a big deal. To think that it doesn't matter. God says it does matter. That no matter what society says, God says it should never be named. People who aren't married shouldn't live together. Shouldn't happen. You say, well, we're not, we're not having sex. We're just we're living together. <laughs> hey, you may not be. But you are opening the door wide open to fall right into it. it is a, that's a foolish decision to make. Absolutely foolish. You are opening the door for sin that God says should never be named among a Christian. I mean, you're picking up that dead filth and carry it around with you everywhere you go. There's not a person in here that would walk around carrying a corpse around everywhere you went. It wouldn't happen. Most of us don't want to go anywhere near something that's dead. I, I like Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving's coming up. And I, I like cooking turkeys. I love a turkey that is cooked properly. I don't just love turkey. But a turkey that's cooked properly is amazing. And uh, I'm, I'm the one who cooks turkey in my house. Uh, there's a few things that I really enjoy cooking. My wife, for the most part, she cooks everything. She is fantastic at it. There's a few things I really enjoy cooking and I'm very particular about. Turkey's one of those things. But you know what? When I get that raw turkey out, I find it kind of disgusting. Like, you got to reach up in the carcass's rear end and pull the neck out. Why they shove it in there, I'm not sure. <laughs> pull the neck out of its rear end, and then you reach where the neck should be, and you pull out the gizzards and the heart and everything else. My father-in-law, I wish he was here today. He's not. He, he likes that part. And I can't stand it. He wants me to cook that part. When I make turkey, we're gonna, I'm going to make turkey for him for Thanksgiving. When he, he wants me to cook that part with the regular turkey, and I find that disgusting. I do it because, you know, over the years, I've kind of worn down my hatred to him, and I kind of <laughs> like him now, but... 
I tolerate them a little bit, so I'll do it. But I, even just that, I find disgusting. Like, I want to prepare the turkey as soon as I can, and as soon as I can get that thing in the oven, what am I doing? I'm washing my hands, I'm trying to sterilize everything. We would never carry around dead carcasses, dead things with us all the time, and yet we want to walk around with this sin of immorality with us like it's no big deal. We walk around carrying this filth. We could really understand the filth of immorality. The casualties of immorality. You see, it doesn't just affect us. You say, well, I'm just looking at a screen on a computer or on my phone. Ain't no big deal. You have no idea. I mean, you are the ones who are fulfilling the supply for sexual slaves. All over this country, people are kidnapped and put into sexual slavery so they can make pornography. That's what you're doing when you're looking at that screen. It's filthy. It's dirty. I mean, the stories that I have heard just in our own town of women who had close calls of being abducted in our town. I tell my wife to be very careful and to always watch everywhere you go. Know everybody who's walking around you at all times. But it's filthy. And we look at it like it's no big deal. Like we can just live our lives the way that we want to. God says no. It's sin. It's filth. It shouldn't be once named among you as Christians. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. I don't think I ever talk about this topic without at least referencing 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, it would do well for all Christians to memorize 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, verses 1 through 8. If you have not yet put this portion of scripture to memory, I would encourage you to work on memorizing it this week. I want to challenge you to do that. It is that important. But he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 and verse number 1, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Now, one of the things I like about the Apostle Paul is the Apostle Paul made it very clear between what was his opinion and what was God's commandment? Earlier, when we were talking to married couples, we looked and he said, this is my suggestion for you. Not a command, this is a, my suggested advice. Here, he says, this is not a suggestion. I'm not suggesting you do this. He says, this is a command from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And as a command from Jesus, we better listen and obey. He says, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. So he says, you want to know God's will for your life? This is it right here. The will of God is that you should abstain from fornication. Your sanctification, which is the process whereby Jesus and, and the Holy Spirit works and takes us from the sinner that we are and conforms us to the image of Jesus Christ. That's what sanctification is. He says, your sanctification, your coming along, being like Jesus Christ, is that you should abstain from fornication. The, the word abstain is to stay away from you want to stay as far away from fornication as you can possibly get. Okay, so if fornication is the destination, I don't want to ever start down that road. I want to put up every single kind of roadblock that I can. And I put up different roadblocks in my life because there's a place I don't want to go. I don't want to get to that place of fornication, so I put up roadblocks and my wife has helped me. We work together. Because if David can fall into it, the man after God's own heart, you better believe this sinful, wicked guy is, can do it. So we put up roadblocks. I'm not alone with women who aren't my wife. Doesn't happen. Why? Because it's a roadblock. I don't want to ever go down the road. It's not only I don't ever want to go down the road, I don't even want somebody to be able to say and make an accusation that I'm going down the road. So I don't, I'm not alone with women. I, w I won't give a woman a ride alone in a car. 
You say, that's ridiculous. I'll be ridiculous. I'm happily married, and I want to stay that way. My wife has access to my entire life, no questions asked. Anytime she wants to get on my iPad, she can do it. No questions. It doesn't bother me, I have nothing to hide. If somebody has a problem handing over their phone and, and not letting their spouse have the passcode, something's the matter. That's the first sign that says there's, there's something wrong right there because you've got something to hide. She's got free access into my life. That's my wife. I don't belong to myself. I belong to her now. I don't ever want to go down the road. He says we need to stay as far away from it. Put up all the roadblocks that we can. And I'm so thankful for my in-laws who had some foresight while my wife and I were dating. They said, you're not going to be alone together. It's not going to happen. If you want to see each other, you go out in public. Go to a restaurant. You go be with friends or whatever else. We ought to set up roadblocks. Teenagers, I would encourage you. Put up some roadblocks. Put up some safeguards. Young adults, put up some guards. Married couples, put up some safeguards. And he says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. He said we ought to have some, learn how to control ourselves. My eyes should not control me. Other areas of my body should not control me. I had to learn how to control myself. That's one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit of God, by the way. The reason we can't control ourselves is because we're not walking with God like we ought to. He says, you ought to know how to control yourself. That's what he means when he says, possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. And we'll talk more about that next week as we talk about lust. But what he's saying is it's lost people who live life controlled by their own lust. Christians never should. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, which hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. And so he says, if you want to live a life of sin, of fornication, God is the one that will pay you back because you are defrauding someone. You are cheating and you are stealing from someone every time you commit fornication. It's not a sin that just affects you. It's not a sin that just affects me. It affects all who are around you. You are cheating and you are stealing from someone. I mean, you're not married and you're looking at pornography. You're stealing from your future spouse. You are cheating them. You have no idea what you're messing with. You have no idea the pain that you are going to cause. Shouldn't happen. Should not once be named. We ought to know how to control ourselves. We ought to be walking so closely with God that we have the strength to control ourselves, to control our mind, to control our eyes, to control our bodies. But instead, we want to live like a spiritual zombie. We want to walk around with the sin of immorality draped all around us. We want to live in that filth. Walk around like it doesn't matter. God says it does matter. Why? Because I've given you life. You're not dead anymore. Why are you still living like you're dead? Why are you still living in that filth? He says, Christians, you've been given life. It should not once be named among you. So you need to take whatever the steps are to take. To get rid of that death. To get rid of that filth. Colossians, he told them, you are to put to death fornication and uncleanness in your life. And there may be some of you here today, and I would say in a crowd this size, there are some of you here today that need to put immorality to death in your life. I would dare say there are men and women in this room who are 
deeply struggling with pornography. It's not just a man issue, by the way. The numbers of women that are struggling with pornography is almost equal now. You need to put that to death. That's going to mean some hard moves on your part. That's going to mean coming clean about some filth that you have. You may have to come and to your husband or your wife. You may have to come to your parents or someone else and say, listen, I am struggling in this area. I need some help. Because you will not beat this thing alone. You will not get out of immorality all on your own. I guarantee you that. You're going to need some help. So it's going to come by saying, I've got a problem. I need some accountability. I need somebody who's going to be helping me, checking up on me. It's going to mean opening up your heart and your life to somebody. And there's some vulnerability that comes with that. But Jesus said, you need to put that to death. That it's not just my advice for you. He said, this is a commandment by the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you may need to come up clean about some relationships that you have. You might need to say, listen, I've, I've fallen. I mean, I, I've failed in this area. The good news is, you can always find forgiveness. And you can always pick up and start brand new and fresh. That's the great thing about the God that we serve. There is nothing that you have done or are doing right now that he cannot forgive you for. But you have to want forgiveness. You have to want to change. It's not I'm sorry and I keep on doing. It's I'm sorry, I'm putting it to death, I'm not going to do it anymore, I'm going to change the way that I'm living my life. That's where we find forgiveness. And there may be some today that need to have some hard conversations You maybe need to put some cards on the table and say, listen, I'm sorry, but I've got a problem here. I'm living a life that is immoral and I need some help to find the road back to purity, the road back to holiness. You have been given life. It's time to live like you've been given life mortify, put to death fornication and uncleanness in your life. 